This video was bizarrely highly requested. There has been kind of an unofficial list of items that people have gathered that are not on the Talos of Tech buy list or on the Talos of Tech okay to buy list. And I thought it would make a lot of sense to just kind of kick off 2023 and kick off February with a video diving into, okay, let's just go over everything in the Apple Sheep ecosystem and see what I personally approve and disapprove of. It's very biased. It's very skewed. You're going to disagree agree with me, I don't care, let's begin. Of course, the core to any Apple Sheep ecosystem has to be the iPhone. And right now, Apple kind of makes it hard to see the entire iPhone lineup, so I had to redesign their which iPhone is right for you page. But starting with the 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max, this is actually a pretty easy buy for me because while yes, it's not that massive of an upgrade over the 13 Pro and Pro Max, this is just what you should get if you want the best of the best. No question of money, it doesn't matter how much it costs, you just want a really, really good phone that's going to last you a long time, that's going to hold its resale value. It's got an amazing camera, great battery life, great display. It's the only iPhone with an always-on display. So, yeah, while it's not necessarily for me or for everybody, it gets my best smartphone of all time selection. So, yes, it's a buy. However, when we come to iPhone 14 and iPhone 14 Plus, reusing the A15 chip, still charging quite a bit for those new models. These, unfortunately, I'm going to have to give a non Telos of Tech approved purchase decision. So yeah, I would definitely feel different if these had USB-C or if they had Dynamic Island or a better chip. This might change when the iPhone 15 lineup drops, but for now, I cannot give the iPhone 14 a buy rating. It's just so insanely similar to what's next in the lineup, the iPhone 13, which I most definitely have to give both the regular iPhone 13 and the 13 mini a serious buy recommendation because they have so much in common with the newer iPhones. And if if you're not a diehard for that 120 hertz pro motion, you don't need that dynamic island, still you can get amazingly good camera performance out of those iPhone 13 series. You can buy them even cheaper, certified refurbished or second hand. They still have very bright displays, very good battery lives, they have MagSafe support and all that. So yeah, iPhone 13 series, both the mini and the regular one are amazing buys. But to kind of contrast that as well, I have to give the iPhone SE 3 a do not buy because not only did they not update the camera, they didn't even give it MagSafe, which they totally could have, but they raised the price by 30 bucks on this iPhone that has so much in common with the SE2, which if you're willing to go with a home button iPhone and have a 4.7 inch LCD display, hey, no judgment here if that's good enough for you, but if that's good enough for you, then an iPhone SE2 is going to be fine and probably half the price or less. You can find those secondhand and refurbished for so much cheaper than the SE3, which makes it so hard to recommend, so I'm going to say don't on that one. And while Apple doesn't make it super obvious on their website, they are still selling the iPhone 12. Not the 12 mini. It's not currently in the lineup, but for $599, it does have a lot of similarities with the 13. I would say my biggest issue with the 12 is just going to be that the battery life is quite a bit worse than the 13, but maybe you live in an environment or work in an environment where you're going to have readily access to chargers, like you have a MagSafe charger in your car, or you don't care too much about the camera performance and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'll definitely still give the iPhone 12 a buy rating. You know, even better if you can find it refurbished or secondhand, but overall, yeah, I would say this is uh, how I view the current iPhone lineup, what you shouldn't and should consider buying depending on your pricing structure. Now, moving on to the iPad lineup. This one is going to be pretty brutal, I'm afraid, because Apple did very little with the M2 iPad Pros other than just slap an M2 chip in there and have the hover feature, and I'm sorry for like 800 and you can scale it up to, you know, well over $2,000 for those models. I'm just gonna have to say don't buy them because they have so much in common with the M1 iPad Pro which you can buy secondhand and even if you just want the best possible tablet, I, I'm sorry, there's not that many advantages to getting the M2 iPad Pro versus the M1 or even the A12X because all of these things are running iPad OS. So all of the enhancements in mini LED or performance or any of that crap you can't really take advantage of because of the OS. So I feel somewhat similarly about the iPad Air 5. 
five, unfortunately. Like, it's cool that they stuck an M1 chip in there and all that, but again, you can't really take advantage of that power all that much with the iPad Air 5 because of the software, and you can find 2018 iPad Pros for way cheaper than what they're charging for the iPad Air 5, so maybe I could recommend it if you find it on sale or at heavily discounted, but for the sake of this video, we're just talking about the new products that Apple is offering, so I gotta say no to the regular iPad Air, and unfortunately, yes, I also have to say no to the iPad 10 because it is a complete disaster of a product. USB-C, but it requires the Lightning Apple Pencil. Also got a massive price increase, 450 bucks. Still not a laminated display. The best thing about it are the color options, but I'm sorry, most of you are gonna buy a folio cover or a keyboard case, and you're not even gonna notice the color option on that iPad you choose. Just very expensive for not that much better. They even chose the slowest possible version of USB 2.0 even though they gave it USB-C, so that's just a crime in my book, so I have to say no to the iPad 10. iPad 9, you know, it's dated, it's old, but a lot of people don't mind having a home button, and a lot of people don't mind using Lightning, because that's what their old iPhone uses, so for the sake of the price being very, very low, I will give the iPad 9 a buy rating, you know? I hesitate to say you should buy it new, though. You can definitely find it cheaper, refurbished, or secondhand. You can find these for sub $200, depending on where you're looking, but the fact is, that iPad, for what iPadOS is good for, A13 chip is fantastic, and it still has a center stage camera, and there's not even a camera bump on this thing. So yeah, it looks a little old, it looks a little dated, but so does the iPhone SE, and there's still people that are happy to buy that, so iPad 9, sure, being the cheapest iPad, I will give it some credit for that. And also, I feel similarly about the iPad mini. In my opinion, this is the best iPad you can buy right now, because iPadOS, with its limitations, you don't really hit the limits of that on a smaller device, which you can hold in one hand. The iPad mini even fits in your pocket. So overall, iPad mini is just a tremendous value. Works with the Apple Pencil 2. Still has the center stage camera. Still has an insane amount of performance with the A15 chip. And it can charge via USB-C. So overall, it's just a great deal. And yes, you can find that cheaper second hand. That goes without saying for all these products. But overall, love the iPad mini. But pretty much any iPad that's more expensive than the mini right now, I don't recommend buying. Like if you need 120 hertz or if you need an iPad bigger than the mini, but you want Apple Pencil 2, support, buy an iPad Pro from 2018. That is just going to save you so much money and give you 99% of the same experience. So there's your buyer's guide for the iPad lineup. Moving on to the AirPods lineup though, this is one that we often don't talk too much about. Starting with the cheapest ones, AirPods 2, I still actually use them from time to time. My wife tends to use them a lot, but they fit really well in my ear and while the audio quality is not amazing, you can't really fight that price very much. For 130 bucks, they are some substantially cheaper than a lot of the other AirPods in this lineup, and I'm not an audiophile, but I still think they sound pretty decent. I know they're not as good as the more expensive options, but I think they sound okay, and for a lot of people that just want bare bones, like basic headphones, they don't need anything fancy. AirPods are classic, they're a bestseller, and Apple sells them for cheap, so I'm grateful that they're there. Now, I feel a little bit differently about AirPods third generation. The audio quality is definitely better, but for 170 bucks, you're still not getting noise cancellation and it's like okay they are cheaper than the pros but especially the fact that you can find AirPods Pros first and second generation for like 200 bucks on Amazon we're talking about such a small difference in price to get a vastly superior product now with AirPods Pro 2 having the find my support in the speaker on the case so this is a bit controversial I feel kind of torn about it but I'm gonna say don't buy on AirPods 3 I don't know I just ran polls on it in the past and most of the time when people voted they said that the AirPods 2 fit better or AirPods Pro fit better. Very few voted that AirPods 3 actually fit them nice, so I feel like it's trying to prioritize audio quality for a demographic of people that obviously really care about active noise cancellation, so that just kind of puts it in this weird in-between zone, kind of like the iPhone 14 series where it's like, you're too expensive to be budget friendly, but you're not pro enough to justify that price. So I'm gonna say don't buy on AirPods 3, but obviously, without question, AirPods Pro 2, easy buy rating. I think these could be the best headphones in the world overall if you just consider battery life, ease of use, noise cancellation, charging options, the audio quality is amazing, the transparency mode is unbelievable, 
unbeatable. They're the only AirPods in the lineup with the H2 chip right now, so absolutely do recommend AirPods Pro 2. AirPods Max, though, yeah, like, they've got some amazing audio quality and some great noise cancellation and transparency mode, but 550 bucks, I'm sorry, that's even a difficult sale at $400 secondhand, because even if you find one for sub $400, they still only charge via lightning, they don't support lossless, they don't even have that good of a charging case, and they've been known to having lots and lots of moisture issues, because unlike AirPods Pro, they are not like water and sweat resistant, and they've had all kinds of problems over the years as people have used them, so maybe I could recommend AirPods Max if you can find them for like $350 to $300, but still, there's a lot of compromises you gotta put up with regardless, and that's why I have them as a don't buy rating. Now this one should be pretty easy, we've only got three in the Apple Watch lineup, and Apple Watch Series 8 is what they start with, and this one just has so little different from the Series 7, and it still costs quite a bit, so I'm gonna put a don't buy rating on the Apple Watch Series 8 just because you can get Series 7s for so much cheaper, and there's almost no differences between the 7 and 8, especially if you're not a woman, you can barely utilize any new features or tech on that. The CPU is reused, but the Apple Watch SE at 250 bucks, like, okay, sure, you can find Series 4s and 5s for cheaper, but this does get the latest and newest S8 chip, which is harder to find an Apple Watch with even an S7 or S6 chip for $250. It can be done, but I know there's a lot of people that just want to buy new, so I'm a little torn on it, but for the most part, yes, the Apple Watch SE got a price reduction as well as added features and functionality over the first generation Apple Watch SE, so I give it a pass. And yes, the Apple Watch Ultra, hands down, amazing deal. The titanium chassis, double the battery life, action button, dual GPS frequencies. It's an amazing watch, and the fact that it's only 800 bucks, undercutting the Apple Watch Edition that it replaces makes it an easy recommendation. Definitely one of the best Apple Watches I think we've gotten in years. So, easy buy recommendation for Apple Watch Ultra. Now we've got a lot of Macs to choose from in the lineup. So starting with the MacBooks, I feel pretty confident in saying that yes, the M1 MacBook Air is still a good buy because a lot of people who just want a cheap basic laptop are going to be more than fine with the 13 inch LCD display. They don't need fancy bells and whistles like notches or full size function keys. They just want a laptop that works and has good battery life and is compatible with their ecosystem in which case, yeah, buy the M1 MacBook Air refurbished or second hand if you can, but still it's way cheaper than basically everything else in the lineup here. M2 MacBook Air, yeah, some of you you might disagree with me here, but I just think that it's catering, again, to the pro market, but not justifying that price considering how close you are to being able to buy a 14-inch or 16-inch MacBook Pro refurbished, and that's just a way better laptop than this is. Some people care about the portability, but honestly, it's not that much lighter, and I didn't find it that much more compact when I reviewed it, so that goes the same for the 13-inch MacBook Pro. If you're a diehard Touch Bar fan, just find an M1 MacBook Pro, you'll find way cheaper cheaper options for that, and the performance is going to be almost identical to the M2 MacBook Pro, and it's just such a dated design, and they're still charging so much for it, so I can't recommend the 13-inch MacBook Pro, and I'm really torn on the new M2 Pro and M2 Max MacBooks, because while they are the fastest notebooks to ever exist, they do make some compromises with the NANs, and that affects the read and write speed, so I guess I will give a buy rating to them, but I'm going to preface that I'm only giving a buy rating if you're buying a one terabyte model or, you know, a higher spec trim, like 96 gigs of RAM, you couldn't get that before. So if you just need the most powerful laptop in the world, period, then yes, buy those. But if you're just looking at the base model, like entry level 14 inch and 16 inch MacBook Pros, no, I wouldn't recommend that. Only if you need lots of extra performance in those non-binned CPUs and GPUs for your work. That's the only situation where I'd recommend those, but it's kind of a lot of strings attached to that buy rating because I, I don't think the performance is really that much faster or justifies the extra price that you have to shill out for those Macs. Now coming over to the desktops, of course, the 24-inch iMac is ugly and dated, so easy, don't recommend that. M2 Mac Mini, though, is easily a recommend because it got a price reduction, and even when they're cheaping out on the NANs, it's still way more powerful, and there's way more options for the Mac Mini now than ever before, which is great. The Mac Studio has some of the best ports and I.O. selection that I've ever seen, and 
That's still a great value if you care more about GPU performance that the Mac Mini can't give you. So I love the frontal I.O. I love that it has an SD card slot, unlike its big ugly brother, the Mac Pro, which still has not been updated. So biggest like do not buy warning across the Mac Pro, of course, seriously, absolutely no justification. There is no reason for anybody to be buying that thing right now. It's about to be refreshed in just a couple of months. So I love these two little towers. I don't think you can go wrong with either of them, but yeah, 24 inch iMac is just too weird and the performance is dated now and the port selection is crap and you can buy an M2 Mac mini and a monitor for way cheaper than what the iMac will charge you for. So yeah, I just can't recommend Mac Pro or iMac. But and then the home division, we have the HomePod mini, which is a very easy recommendation for me at only 99 bucks and you can get it cheaper secondhand. Still has a lot of great sound quality and even will tell you the humidity and temperature levels in your bedroom. But I don't think we can justify $300 on smart speakers. You know, the sound quality is great, but there's still no ports to connect to it directly. You can't even output to the full-size HomePod via Bluetooth. They didn't learn anything from the first generation HomePod. This is just a weird, like, let's try it again for no reason. The display is a little bigger, I guess, but whatever. Do not buy the $300 HomePod. But Apple TV 4K, this got faster, this got slimmer, it got USB-C with the Siri remote. So I'm gonna recommend both of them. If you really care about Ethernet, it's only 20 bucks more, which is not that much and I know a lot of people that won't care about the Ethernet, so if that's the case, 130 bucks for the Apple TV 4K is a great deal, and it's fanless now. Much, much better than the pricing it was before, plus they doubled up on the storage, which is excellent, so easy recommendation for all of the Apple TVs available now. And I think all we have last is Apple services, which I don't really pay for any of these, but I thought it'd be fun to include them in the buyer's guide. So Apple Music, while the price is getting a little bit higher than Spotify, it does still offer amazing sound quality quality and a great user interface and I've been using a free trial for the past few months and I'm loving it. I love the lyrics feature. It's much better than Spotify's and the sing-along feature. Of course, you guys love that. Apple TV Plus, you know, I'm not paying for it because I'm again on another free promo, but I got to admit there's a lot of movies and shows we found on it that we like and it's basically cheaper than most other streaming services considering there's no ads, whereas most other services, if you want to get cheaper than five bucks a month, you got to get some ad supported tier, which Apple doesn't do yet, so I kind of do recommend Apple TV Plus, but Fitness Plus, it's just workout videos, guys. Come on, like, you can look at your Apple Watch and check your heart rate while watching any YouTube video and get the same thing. I can't recommend it for seven bucks a month. That's quite a bit of money for just enthusiastic workout videos, and Apple Arcade has some awesome games on it, but the fact that it's five bucks a month and you can't really take any of those games off of Apple Arcade makes it very expensive, and in my opinion, none of the games justify that infinitely growing price of arcade, so don't recommend that either. But of course, we may need to do more of these in the future, depending on what Apple releases and how they price it. But now you guys have a more official breakdown of what I think is a good buy and a bad buy. Do any of you have ecosystems that are purely of things I don't approve of? Feel free to let me know down in the comments below. And thank you to everybody supporting this channel directly on Talos of Tech Pro. Seriously, helps us out a ton, as does just watching these videos. So thanks again. This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.